Dopamine is the most misunderstood concept in all of neuroscience. The mother load of dopamine misinformation surrounds this viral trend of dopamine detoxing, where people are promised complete conquering of their lives if only they can abstain from using their phones for 24 hours. Unfortunately, this is just not how it works at all. Dr. Anna Lemke is a neuroscientist and chief of the Stanford Department for Addiction Medicine. She's also the author of Dopamine Nation, an amazing book about how to actually beat dopamine addictions. This is a protocol that I've personally tried multiple times and it really has had a profound effect. The acronym is dopamine and each letter represents an important step in the process. So be sure to watch the whole video for the best chances of beating your addictions. The first step is data. This is all about understanding your own relationship with different dopamine sources. So get a piece of paper and write out all of your different unhealthy sources of dopamine. What are you using? How much are you using? And through what means are you using? Just get it all down on paper so you can have a clear understanding of what you're actually using. There are four categories that you really should be looking to cut out. Number one is bingeable technology. Social media, Netflix, video games, forums, and news sites. These need to be physically removed from your phone. Two is unhealthy sources of sex. These include pornography, masturbation, dating apps, everything like that. Next is drugs, alcohol, or sugary foods. Consumables are far too easy a source of dopamine when we are trying to peel everything back. The only way to make meaningful differences in the brain is to fight back against these temptations and cavings when you have them. The last ones are adrenaline seeking activities like gambling, bungee jumping, impulse shopping, anything where you get a rush of adrenaline and dopamine from doing it. In 2024, our brains are wired to reach for cheap dopamine the second we are bored. But if we fight against it time after time, this is how our brain actually rewires itself and becomes comes more durable. If it's not a struggle, you aren't doing it right. That's why any easy dopamine fast is bullshit. It needs to be difficult. The actual struggle is where the neuronal rewiring is happening. The next step is O and it stands for objective. What is your actual objective from these different dopamine sources? You might never actually even take a second to think about what your objective with these dopamine sources is. This is when our behavior becomes habitual and we are not in control. This is dopamine in the driving seat and you're simply the vessel that is orchestrating its acts. Being conscious of your actual objectives means you can be more aware when you fall into these bad habits. At the moment, I have far too much of a compulsion to check my YouTube analytics. This is causing me to check my phone way too regularly and that is not on my list of objectives that I want and hence it has to be scrapped. P stands for problems. Are your dopamine sources causing you issues in your life? This is where you have gotta get honest with yourself. Don't get defensive. Your gut instinct might be to say no and to fight against it. But again, this protocol will simply not work unless you're actually digging for those answers that you need. It's about being radically honest with yourself, peeling back the curtains and seeing all of the mess and chaos that's underneath. Again, for me, my problem was simply checking my YouTube analytics. While this seems small, it was massively disrupting my ability to enter a proper flow state throughout the day. And this really prevents meaningful work getting done. In relation to drugs and alcohol, this definitely causes problems with my sleep. It's never made a huge difference in my life before, but now training 10 to 20 hours per week, the difference between seven hours and six hours is absolutely massive. Again, this is personal to me, so you have to find what problems you're personally having. Flow is absolutely crucial to my well-being. It's one of the main reasons that I've picked up triathlon because swimming, cycling, and running for me is flow heaven. But I've really been struggling to enter the flow state during work, which is why I've started taking Magic Mind every single day. Magic Mind is a mental performance shot that tastes great and contains your daily requirements of vitamin C and D, and it genuinely makes me feel more motivated and focused. But as you know, on this channel, we follow the research, so here it is. Magic Mind contains 250 grams of the highly studied ashwagandha, shown to significantly reduce psychological stress. Another study showed that serum cortisol concentrations, which is the stress molecule, were significantly reduced. And this is definitely the most noticeable thing when I take Magic Mind. I'm calm, but focused and relaxed. Exactly the state I want to be in for flow. Another ingredient I love is Rhodiola rosea. In a very interesting study, 200 milligrams taken daily for four weeks showed a statistically significant improvement in VO2 max. This is the gold standard for me as a triathlete, but also Peter Atia, one of the leading longevity 
longevity experts in the world frequently talks about how VO2 max is one of the strongest predictors of longevity and general health. But of course, none of this is relevant unless you're getting proper sleep, diet, and exercise. I take Magic Mind directly after lunch while I'm on my walk in replacement of my second coffee of the day. And this means that I have less caffeine in my brain while going to sleep, but I can still turbo through that post-lunch slump. Magic Mind are offering my viewers 56% off your first subscription using the code EVANMAC in the link below. Another thing I love is that Magic Mind donate five cents to mental health charities for every single bottle sold and offer a 100% money back guarantee if you're not 100% satisfied. So you literally don't lose anything for trying it out. Again, that's Evan Mack in the link description, 56% off your first subscription. Check it out. We finally get to A, which is abstinence. This is the fasting part, where we decide to completely remove our sources of dopamine from our lives for an extended period of time. The duration of abstinence is important because different dopamine sources have different effects on our reward system. This is another difference between a bullshit protocol and one that actually works. You can't just not use your phone for 24 hours and then beat your porn addiction or your drug addiction. It's just not how it works. The brain encodes long-term memories of reward and their associated cues by changing the shape and size of dopamine producing neurons. This is called experience dependent neuroplasticity. The extent of the shape change is related to how much dopamine is released into the synaptic cleft, which is also a direct measure of how addictive a substance is. For context, chocolate increases dopamine by about 55%, sex about 100%, nicotine 150%, cocaine 155%, and amphetamines an insane 1000%. Dr. Lemke's clinical recommendation is a full four weeks of abstinence for our dopamine circuits to properly rewire themselves back to baseline. Now this might sound difficult, but it depends again what your problems are and what sources you're using. Take a look at what you filled out for data, objectives and problems, and then figure out your time of abstinence from there. If you have a drug or alcohol problem, a full 30 days is probably required to have any meaningful impact. If it's just something like social media, then something closer to a week or 10 days is probably okay for you. But for some addictions, it will take longer than 30 days. Again, struggle is key. Remember that. Get solace from that when you're really struggling, that that struggle is key. That's where change occurs. So you've started your abstinence journey and shock horror, it's actually quite difficult. Our dopamine fueled brains do not like having to suffer through boredom, silence or long walks or anything like that. That's why mindfulness is day five. I think for people with even minor addictions, you're gonna be quite shocked at how difficult it is to abstain from these cheap dopamine sources that your brain is so used to at the moment of boredom. I've been pretty bored the last few days. This happens every time I do this protocol. It's never easy and it doesn't get easier. But I always feel empowered by that understanding that in that struggle is where the dopamine rewiring is happening. This is what pushes me through it and gets me to lean even further into the discomfort because I know that's how you get the best results. Leaning into the uncomfortableness is reclaiming your natural ability to feel pleasure from slow dopamine difficult struggle dopamine. In the past few months, my escape from cheap dopamine has been endurance sports, long runs, long swims, and long cycles. This is when I feel like I'm controlling my life, where cheap habitual dopamine is not in the driver's seat, but I am the one dictating the path of my future. It's important you find these activities for yourself. The slower and more natural the dopamine, the stronger the neuronal rewiring is going to be. The next stage is insight. You've completed your extended abstinence from your different dopamine sources, and usually in that extra time of thought, you've had a few insights about your life. Every time I complete a dopamine fast, I have the realization of how much of my life I'm wasting on this cancerous cuboid, and it doesn't even make sense to me how I keep coming back to it. An insight I had on a previous protocol was how little I actually engaged with the outside world when I was outside. The second I wasn't with somebody or had something to do, I was checking my phone, checking my analytics, checking X, or instantly just distracted by social media. How often do you really take the time to look around and be present in the moment? This led to a pretty radical change for me where I haven't had internet on this device for about five months. It means that whenever I'm outside and I'm bored, I can't just reach for my phone because it doesn't really do anything. I can read my books on it and I have my audiobooks, and those are two healthy things that I really enjoy with my phone. And this has been incredibly freeing for me. 
me. Studies show that 40% of our behaviors are completely habitual. That means that almost half of our lives are fully automatic and we have almost no agency. This really scared me when I learned it. It means that we have a zombie-like propensity to just stumble in a particular life direction and never question if this is the direction we want to go in. One thing that pushes us towards habitual behavior is chronic overstimulation of our dopamine reward pathways. If we pick up our phones and swipe on TikTok the second that we are bored, we leave no time to actually think about our lives and try and gain agency over our direction. Not everybody needs to have a life altering insight, but big or small, write it down, ruminate on it and really think it through. How is this gonna impact your life and change your direction going forward? The N is next steps. If you are successful in identifying your objectives, problems and then abstaining from those sources of dopamine, then you possibly could have fundamentally different reward architecture than you did at the start of this protocol. This is nothing short of magic. With your new hardware update, you get to decide how you want to reintroduce these dopamine sources into your life. Or in the extreme cases of dopamine sources, not at all. With the cravings gone and the pull to use these things compulsively, we can now actually think and apply agency and thought to how we want to use these objects in our lives. One thing I know for sure is that I'm never keeping my phone on my desk when I'm working ever again. Having it in arm's reach is simply a recipe for me to never enter the flow state. I would love to hear if any of you have gone through this process and have had any insights or made any changes in your life. They might help other people in the community. If you're enjoying this video and are interested in more impactful neuroscience where we learn about the brain and life, then consider subscribing. It helps more than you know. We really appreciate it. The last step is experiment. This is the implementation stage of the next steps. This is where we test out different systems and see how it impacts our lives. It's important to know that whatever plans we make might not turn out perfectly. It's very easy to slip back into old habits and find ourselves in the habitual zombie-like process once again. Test out different systems for reintroduction and experiment like a startup founder building a product. It never goes to plan, but we must keep adjusting and keep rescheduling until we find something that really works for us. If you're still struggling to stay off your phone, then check out my neuroscience guide to improving your attention and focus. I'm confident that will help. Thank you so much for watching the video.